Good afternoon and welcome to Inside Entrepreneurship, a webinar series hosted by the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative, the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Alliance, and the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for taking time out of your day to connect virtually with fellow Hoyas for today's conversation, The Power of Persistence with Gretchen Hansen and Jeff Reed. Our host, Jeff Reed, is the founding director of the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative and professor of entrepreneurship at the McDonough School of Business. As Georgetown's entrepreneurship programs have grown under Reed's leadership, the school has been ranked among the best in the world for entrepreneurship by the Financial Times, Bloomberg, Business Week, and others. Reed is a catalyst for entrepreneurship, economic development, and a well-known leader in entrepreneurship education. I'm Kelly Young, Associate Director of Strategic Engagement in Alumni Relations, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few tips and reminders. This conversation is being recorded. The recording will be made available on our YouTube channel, and you will receive the link in a follow-up email. Jeff and Gretchen will take questions at the end of their discussion. Please send in your questions using the questions section of the webinar control panel. If you're having any technical difficulties or other issues, please submit those concerns via the questions section of the control panel as well. But without any further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Jeff. Thank you so much, Kelly. Welcome to our audience. Uh, just once, once again to highlight our series of webinars on entrepreneurship today, we have Gretchen. We'll talk about the power of persistence. Uh, on July 8th, we will start up again with a session on entrepreneurial problem solving featuring Fabio Rosati, who is currently the chairman of SNAG and a former CEO of Upwork and Elance, a real expert in the gig economy and, uh, and building and growing companies. Uh, on July 22nd, we will have a session on entrepreneurship as a social movement featuring the three founders of Good Projects who are leading a lot of the activities uh, in DC and demonstrations these days. And uh, they're all proud Hoy alumni and members of our Georgetown Venture Lab. So with that, we're gonna, uh, oh, one last thing. I just wanna, again, recognize our partners here, the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative and the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Alliance. We love working together to build one big community around Georgetown entrepreneurship. So with that, we will dive in now with Gretchen. And I'm going to stop showing my screen and, uh, and let's say welcome, Gretchen. How are you today? Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Jeff. Hello, everybody. Um, happy Wednesday. <laughs> awesome. So Gretchen is the founder and uh, recent past CEO of Decorist. Uh, but let's let's get to know a little bit about you before you became an entrepreneur. Tell us, uh, just give us an introduction of, of kind of how you got to the point where you became an entrepreneur. Sure, uh, I graduated from School of Foreign Service and after that I spent three years in DC as a consultant. And I think for me that experience really helped me understand, do I want to go into business? Do I want to go into law school? Help me understand what it was like to work in a big, Big, with big companies and get some operating experience. So I went, I went to a business school from there. And right after business school, I was very fortunate to get a job with the Clorox Corporation and I was in brand management. And for me, it was such a defining experience because it allowed me to really understand how you develop a consumer product. How do you understand that consumer base? How you develop products to meet their needs or to solve problems that they have, how you launch those products into the mass market. It was very, very foundational for me. And I think really helped set me up in many ways for my entrepreneurial career. After that, I spent many years in and out of, of different operating experiences in consumer products, both in tech and non-tech until, until I started my company. So all right. background. That's great. Well, yeah, getting all that experience building and running products for bigger companies helped you when it came yeah. time to create your own. So tell us about the story that inspired Decorous. What is the, uh, the origin of your business? Sure. Well, I'm actually sitting in my in the office that inspired it right now. I can't show you the whole thing right now because it's a total mess. I apologize. Um, but we were renovating. I didn't plan on starting this company at all. I thought it would be something more along the lines of a mass market consumer product. Um, but for the first time, we, we were renovating our home in San Francisco. For the first time ever, I was going to have my own home office. So I was so excited. And I'm a huge fan of vintage furniture. And I walked into one of my favorite stores in San Francisco. And right in front of me were the most perfect 
bright pink tufted modern Milo Boffman 1970s lounge chairs that I'd ever seen. And I immediately fell in love with them. I, you know, bought them on the spot. I didn't even negotiate and I always negotiate. Uh, threw them in the back of my car, dragged them up the stairs, put them in my office, which I'm looking at right now. And um, they looked absolutely terrible. Everything about them was horrible. They were the wrong size. They were the wrong color. They were the wrong style. And so I called a friend of mine who was a designer and I explained it to her. And this was back in 2013-14. So iPhone use was not what it is today. And she said, well, send me photos. So I sent her photos and three days later, she knocks on my door and she brings a rug, a pillow and a, I think a chair. And within 15 minutes had completely reorganized, redecorated my office and it looked fantastic. The chairs were the centerpiece. You can see in the photo down there, I'm, I'm sitting in one of those chairs. Um, and it was just this amazing sort of experience that I had. And I looked at her and I said, wow, that was amazing. Can you do that for other people? And she said, sure. And I said, no, I mean, if, if they send you pictures of their home and you've never seen that home, can you design for them without being there? And she said, absolutely. And that for me was when the alarm bells really started going off, right? I took all these past consumer products experiences I had had. And I said to myself, wow, if I just had this experience I can only imagine that there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of people out there who would also like to get this experience because we've all had to really sort of fend for ourselves when it comes to decorating, right? At least up until then, um, most of us can't afford to go out and hire a decorator. So you have to do it yourself and you struggle through it and it's fun on the one hand, but it's also really stressful and can be expensive on the other. And so if there was a way to kind of deliver really high quality help at a low cost virtually, um, you know, that's that's what we went for. So immediately grabbed some colleagues of mine that I'd worked with at Clorox actually, started doing some research into the category, really diving into kind of understanding what are some of the attitudes and behaviors behind this customer and, and potential customer because the category didn't exist then um, and how we were going to approach it. So then everything just sort of snowballed from there and, and um, didn't stop. That's the, that's the story. Oh, that's great. So the so it started off with a problem that you had yourself, and exactly. uh, and you were so surprised and delighted by the the work that a designer could do on your own room without having actually actually been there, right? Just based on yeah. a few pictures. Yeah, that's right. So that's great. Well, what, what were some moments? And that was the aha moment, right? It wasn't one that I had planned on, but it just happened, and it was kind of this thing where you say you have to at least try and see where this can go right so okay well let's talk about those early days so the company is called decorist and it's yeah. online interior decorating advice uh and or maybe there's a better way you can describe it i uh, would yeah tell us what the company has done and then what were some of the early challenges and struggles you ran into sure um well we are an online interior design company and and Really what that means is it's a it's an online service and experience. And that's it's new in a couple of ways. It's new in the sense that online interior design didn't exist at the time, but also online experiences and services didn't exist. So they we were trying to do two things at once, solve the interior design problem, but also solve this idea of how do you deliver an online virtual service? Because um, they're kind of separate. And so we didn't real we didn't realize that in the beginning, um, but we came or came to realize that you know a year or two into it all. Um, and I think early on, you know, the most important thing is focusing. It's so easy, and I I still I talk to so many entrepreneurs now. You have so many ideas. There are so many ways you can go with something, especially when it's a new category, right? Like we knew we wanted to deliver online design advice, but there are a gazillion ways in which you could do that. You could start with product advice. You could start with, you know, just a, a video tour of somebody's home. You could start with just ask a designer a question. Our first beta product, we, and we had done all the research. We launched four different products because that's what the research told us is the cus customers want. They want just to be able to ask a question. They want to be able to do a, a quick update to their room. They want a full, you know, room layout and they want pain advice. And so that's what we launched with. And we very quickly realized that was way too much for any customer, consumer to, to figure out. They didn't even know what this product or category was. 
and we were asking them to do way too much work to figure it out. So almost immediately we realized that and pulled it back to one product. We did a room design and that was it. And we nailed that product. We were very like almost maniacal about it in terms of how do you define the product? How do you deliver the product? How do you then understand the metrics behind customer success for that product? And so once we had that under our belts, then we could open it up to more, more products and, and services. But it was really critical to focus on that one product and that customer base and nail that one first. So let's, I want to know a little bit more about kind of the nitty gritty in those early days, right? So you started off, you told us how the idea came about. And you mentioned you had you know, product experience working with bigger companies, but what, you know, did you raise money right away or, or did you, I know you said you reached out to some of your friends to help you develop it. What were kind of the first steps when, and you kind of decided you were going to start this company. What, what did it take to get it off the ground? Yeah, it's a great question because um, there's really no one roadmap for that for anybody really. But for me, it was, I need to understand if there's really a market here. Um, and so I had this great experience, but you know, is that something that can translate to a much bigger market? And so for me, doing that kind of foundational research was really critical. Um, as I said, I grabbed somebody that I worked with at Clorox in, the in consumer research, it was very, very good. And we did a series of, of not only qualitative, but quantitative um, research tests to understand like what was it about this product and market that, that was really kind of the key consumer nuggets. Um, and so we found that really people just, they really um, loved decorating. They loved the idea of a beautiful home. In fact, they loved it so much that how their home looked actually impacted how they felt about themselves. So the, the beauty in that was there was this really great emotional benefit, which we learned very early on. Like, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, working in cleaning products for many years, as I did, you're constantly trying to, to pull out the emotional benefit of a, a cleaning product, which can be challenging. Um, but this one, it was just kind of right in front of us and it was big, right? It was how people felt about themselves and their homes. Um, on the flip side of it, though, it was very stressful and overwhelming, right? We learned that as well. You know, if you make a mistake, it can cost a lot of money. You can't return something. Um, it doesn't maybe look exactly the way you want it to. There's a lot of pressure. As Pinterest had just come out at the time. So people were seeing all these incredible images of rooms and a lot of pressure to sort of have that, that similar type of room. And so, you know, for us, just understanding what the positives and the, and the negatives and how to think about talking about the pro problem, what the value proposition was of our product, and then how to deliver it. And, and as I said, quickly focusing on just one product to do that. Yeah. Like, so, yeah, sorry, well, go ahead. I know that, uh, so you, you've been helping our Georgetown Entrepreneurship Program in different ways, including mentoring some of our student entrepreneurs. And, and, and this is one of the things we talk about a lot, is how do you really understand what customers really yeah. want and need? And you've mentioned how you did some of that. And, and how that was really your focus at the beginning was really understanding the customers. Were there yeah. any particular tools or uh, techniques you used that were especially helpful in kind of understanding yeah. what customers wanted? Yeah, and, and it's great now because there are so many more that are available. We sort of had to hack things together, but um, you know, we did a lot of in-person focus groups. We would just call friends, friends of friends, um, have them come sit with us. Um, and talk them through different aspects of the product. We would literally, you know, paperboard it. We would put sort of screens together on paper and say, is this what you want to see? Is this how you would want to see it? So we would very meticulously kind of present that to different consumers. Then we would do quantitative tests where we would go out to a thousand people using things like SurveyMonkey um, to really understand some of those key insights and attitudes and behaviors and how we were going to talk about the product. Um, it's funny because, you know, you and I both talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, Jeff, and one of the things they want to do so immediately is they want to get their marketing out there. They, they have all these great ideas to market what they're doing. And oftentimes, you know, you're best served at spending the vast majority of your time really nailing what that product and the value proposition is because everything flows from there once you have that. It yeah. all becomes clear. <laughs> That's great. Well, that's great. And, and I'm curious, how was that process different for you when it's your business and you've got, you know, a startup team? 
versus when you work for a company like Clorox, where you have yeah. you do some of the same techniques, but you have a lot more resources and, and yeah. maybe a history with the product category, that sort of thing. So what was what were the differences of between being an entrepreneur, doing it yourself, and doing some similar things with a big company? Yeah, well, money was one. Um, you know, I was funding the company in the early days myself because I wanted to really, I wanted to be really sure that we had something before we went out and, and raised money from others. Um, and so money is one. And so you really have to, you know, research budgets can be extremely expensive in big companies. You really have to be kind of scrappy about how you do things. And I think um, and another piece of advice I would have is don't lose your scrappiness ever. Right. It's, it's such a good thing to be able to think creatively. How can I solve this? How can I get this research done? Not for ten thousand dollars, but for five hundred dollars. And, and there were ways then to do it. Now there are so many, you know, inexpensive online tools. It's fabulous. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of resources for entrepreneurs out there now. And, and I think, you know, doing doing the research and cons and you talk about this, I know a lot too, Jeff, constantly getting customer feedback. You don't, you don't just stop when you think you've nailed the value proposition. You're constantly iterating on that. That's yeah. great. Yeah, you don't have a, cust uh, a company if you don't have any customers, right? That's right. That's you know, right. No matter how cool you think your idea is. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned fundraising, right? So did you go out and try to raise venture capital? I know ultimately you raised money from a corporation. So talk about the experience and what that was like. Yeah. So it's funny because I, you know, I think a lot of these um, trends are, are being talked about a lot then, but this was 2015 and we were a team of all women. It right? wasn't that long ago, right? I mean, it, it, it might feel like a long time ago. Yeah. It's five years ago, but it feels like a million things have changed. I think so for, for the better, which is wonderful. Um, but inevitably it was the three of us walking into a group of men um, sitting around a table and explaining our product to them. And, you know, we were often met with kind of scratches of the head. And I think I need to ask my wife about that or wait a minute, you're, gonna, you're telling me that a designer who you've never met is never going to go to your house and design for you and that customer is going to buy all the furniture that that designer recommends. And they would just, you know, shake their heads. And so it was, you know, on the, on the one hand, I think they were, they were very um, eager to learn from us. But on the other hand, it was very hard for them to relate to the product. And so, so it was a challenge early on. What, what I will say is that VCs, aren't always necessarily at the forefront of thought. I think they like to think them, of themselves that way, um, but they're not necessarily on the operating front lines of businesses. And that's where you can sometimes find the most receptive um, funders. And, and that's what happened to us because while the VCs weren't quite as like enthusiastic, at least early on, they, they changed their tune after a while, um, retailers understood what we were doing immediately. So within a month of us launching, we got contacted by Target, by Lowe's Corporation, um, and eventually had partnerships at the national level with all of those companies. Um, we were also talking to Amazon right before we were acquired about offering our services to, you know, to many, many of their customers. So, so the retailers understood the value of what we were doing immediately. They are all trying to sell furniture. Right, it's hard to sell furniture online if you don't have somebody that can give you advice on what that furniture is going to look like in your home. Um, so, so we were very fortunate that Lowe's Corporation, um, very early on, saw the value, brought us into their fold. Um, they were our our biggest funder and and stayed our biggest funder throughout until the acquisition. Yeah, so that's great, and they. They, the retailers figured it out, right? So they had a problem that you were solving for them. You were solving right. a problem for your end customer, but also creating a new channel for these products, these home furniture products to be sold. Uh, and so you've you've already mentioned the acquisition. So tell us that story. It wasn't Lowe's that acquired you. So. No, we thought it would be, um, to be honest. They had had a management change, which changed things. Um, we had several companies interested in us and um, you know, the board and I decided that probably is it advisable to hire a banker and, and see where this goes, right? Is one of the things we realized with the model and the economics of the company is that it's, it's important to be vertically integrated. Um, you need to have that connection to a furniture business to really make the model fully work. And so for us, it was either go acquire a furniture business, 
somehow build one, which is extremely expensive, um, or partner with somebody who had one that was, you know, already entrenched and very, you know, they were an expert at that. So, so we decided to at least explore that option given some of the interest we had were seeing. Um, and it was a very interesting, it was my the first acquisition. I, I don't know if it'll be my last acquisition process. Um, but you realize acquisitions are really hard. You know, um, they're hard in the sense that you shouldn't bank on them. <laughs> because even when everybody is totally in agreement, like, yes, this is great. Oh, we want to do this, which we saw several times, you know, there are so many things that have to happen you know, to actually have that deal close at the end of the day. And so I look back on that process now and I think, wow, that was, that was interesting and, and happy it happened. And, you know, we were pretty fortunate. So. So you, you sold the business to Bed Bath & Beyond, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so you and your co-founders were able to take it to that level. Right. And, but then you didn't leave the company when you, when you sold it. No. So no, this is I, another piece of the experience, right? So you were essentially an employee of a bigger company for several was, years. Which, you know, for me, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I like to, I like to do my own thing. And um, I will say they were very good about letting us be independent. Um, and so I have, you know, I have to give them credit for that. They understood that we, we were the experts in our category. We understood they brought expertise in a number of other areas that we didn't have. Um, and so I think overall it was a very positive partnership and I think, you know, the, the company is, is doing very well and will continue to do very well under Ben Bath's, you know, direction. So it's, it's nice to see. I mean, you know, a lot of acquisitions end in sort of the things getting put on the back shelf, right? And this one didn't um, and that is, is lovely for me to see. So how long were you... So you continue to be CEO of the business even after it was acquired. How long was that period when you were kind of owned by Bed Bath and Beyond, but you were still leading the team? How yeah. long was that? And then what were the key differences? You said they gave you some autonomy, which is great, but I'm sure there were some things that were different. Yeah, it was a full three years. So um, you know, I spent it's been a good amount of time there. And you know, what's different, you know, obviously a lot's different. You have access to so many resources in a big company. And we've learned this from our Lowe's experience too. And one of the biggest reasons we decided to partner with them was, you know, distribution. Distribution is, is probably the biggest challenge. And that can be digital or physical or both. And is, is probably the biggest challenge of any new company, right? It is extremely expensive to acquire new customers. And if you can plug in to a company that has 20 million people going through their stores every month, you know, that is a huge, huge advantage that you can leverage. And so not only with Lowe's, but also with other retailers that we partnered with and eventually with Bed Bath & Beyond, we knew that was kind of our first goal is how do we start to leverage their distribution channels um, and their marketing arm to, to build not only our brand, but also the category and help consumers understand what they can get out of um, online design services. So Yeah, it's, it's true in probably any consumer business, but especially if the product at the end of the day is furniture, it's, yeah. it's really important to be able to, to have a nearby uh, partner that can get the furniture to the customer, right? And not have to spend as much money on shipping it around the world, around the country. That's right. And how can you build confidence in that purchase process for that customer? And it's it's not only having a relationship with the designer, but it's also things like visualization technologies. Those are hugely important to, to, that, to the category. And so that was also something that we had spent a lot of time on um, in the last year or so before I left. So... All right. Well, tell me tell me a little bit more about the competition. Now, you mentioned that um, Pinterest was kind of a driver, right? The, the fact yeah. that Pinterest had taken off around the time you started was was really helping kind of grow the category. But what were some other companies that you were competing against? Yeah, I mean, we had, you know, if you really looked at the full universe, it was, it was quite a bit. There was everything from One Kings Lane, who had also launched at the time. Um, they were making well-designed furniture very affordable and accessible online. So, while it was competition for us, it was also helping us because it allowed us to deliver our service and, and produce a beautiful room at you know not extremely high in prices. 
So you had kind of that force and a lot of companies jumping on that bandwagon. and you had the, the sort of content of the Pinterest and the houses of the world. You know, we looked at our, it was really white space because we, we brought those two elements together and said, okay, how can we deliver on this need for a beautifully designed room while the customer feels like they don't really know how to get there? How do we, how do we take them on that journey? Um, we definitely had competitors. They were all startups like us. We all interestingly kind of started right around the same time or the zeitgeist or something. I don't know what you attribute it to. Um, some raised a lot more money than we did, which, you know, in the beginning, you sort of get nervous about that. And I guess the piece of advice I would have is, especially if you're in a new category, do not worry about competition. Like, do your thing. Be, be sure of your product. Focus on your customer. You know, tune it out to the extent that you can, because inevitably, like, as long as you think what you're doing is right and really focus on that customer, you're going to do better than your competition. Inevitably, the, the two big competitors that we had that raised more money than we did went, you know, went under um, because I think they, they didn't do what we did, which was understand that value proposition and the metrics that drove that value proposition early on. Um, and so it's easy to get caught up in competition, you know, try not to the other, the other piece of it is, especially in a category, like, Competition builds the category, which is really what you want, right? Because nobody knew what online interior design was five years ago. And if you've got several companies spending money on Google and, you know, marketing that the product in the category, as long as you come out with the best product, you're going you're gonna to win. That's great. Well, so we have a, a, another question from our audience. A couple of the ones I've asked you have come from there. Um, sure. The question's around building out the technology, and, and I'll, I'll add a little bit to this, you know, but the, the question is, you know, how did you find the team or the tech resources and talent to build, as you know, online interior decorating is different than, you know, just buying, when someone has to look inside your home, there's a different level of technology, right, and then connecting it to the designers. So I guess the simple way to ask the question is, how did you find the tech talent to build your technology, and then... I'll add to that, and and, uh, and I know that you had a very widely distributed team, right? You had people all over the world, so that might be part of the answer. I'm, I'm curious if you can also share kind of how, uh, what it was like managing a, a, a widely distributed team. Yeah, so the engineering was the hardest part for sure, bar none. Um, I wasn't an expert in any of it in the beginning. You become an expert because you have to, um, and I'd never managed an engineering team to that level. Um, the answer to it is you you find the best that you can afford and you make do and you get a product out and it's not going to be what you want it to be and it's going to have problems and be okay with that and just get it out get it out as quickly as you can and then as you start to get some traction as you start to raise more money you can improve and build upon that team we probably had six different engineering teams over the course of six years i would say um, all of them based outside of the U.S. Um, we started where we could, we made do, and then we we continuously upgraded. I, you know, I mean, that's kind of the way it works. Um, so, and, did, uh, so was one of your co-founders a tech uh, have a tech ha um, sorry tech background, or was that, or was it something you had to outsource from the very beginning? Yeah, in the very beginning, it was just me. So I, I sort of had to wade through the mud on that one and figure it out. Eventually, we did. I did pull in um, folks with, with technical backgrounds, um, both women, actually, um, not intentionally. It just so happened that, you know, they were the most interested in the category and the product. So um, that was a big help um, and, a, and a big help at kind of getting us to the next level with the with our engineers. Um, managing remotely, I think, you know, it's so second nature to us as a business because everything we do, we don't touch any physical product. Or, you know, when I was there, we didn't touch anything. Um, and so remote was just a way of life for us. And so it was, it didn't really matter where our team was. I mean, the only issue is sort of the time change and who's getting up at 7 a.m. or what time do you have the, the stand-ups? Is it 7 a.m. or is it at night? And, you know, kind of managing through that. But, um, I, you know, I. I love the fact that business is so international right now and that we can all at a moment's notice be on the phone with Pakistan or India or the Ukraine or Portugal. I mean, any one of those places, you know, has exceptional talent and it's wonderful to, to be able to utilize that talent. 
spoken very well like a uh, school of foreign service graduate uh, or anyone from Georgetown right with a global mindset yeah um, that's so right. you know a couple of questions come out of that you know one is you know thinking back to your time at Georgetown uh, was there anything in particular that that you would point to from that time at Georgetown that has helped you in your career uh, and your life since leaving school yeah I mean I think I guess just general. I mean, Georgetown is so unique and amazing. I mean, obviously, I'm a big fan. Um, it is one of the world's preeminent educational institutions in one of the most exciting cities in the world. But it also has this incredible foundation of the Jesuit tradition, which everybody knows and feels that's a Georgetown graduate. You want to make the world a better place. And it could not be more relevant today, right? Like, look at everything that's happening in the world. And I, and I think about that a lot because, um, you know, you, you know, as much as things change, they still say the same, right? 30 years ago, that was, you know, what I was feeling and hearing when I was there. And today, I hope that the Georgetown, ki the kids that are in school there feel that same um, mission to make the world a better place because they can do it. And and Georgetown facilitates that in, in so many in, in overt ways and less overt ways. And I, you know, I remember as a freshman, I, I got my course list and the problem of God was on that course list. And I, I thought to myself, oh, geez, what is this class? You know, what, what am I going to learn? I, was, I wasn't anxious about it, but I was definitely sort of a little bit apprehensive walking into the class as taught by a priest. And, and here I am, like, what's this all about? It was, as, as anybody who's to ever taken this class, the most amazing class I have ever taken in my life. Um, it really had very little to do with the problem of God and everything to do with how do you have a, a conversation about or with people who have very different beliefs than you? And how can you find common ground? And to me, there is no better kind of way to approach education than to teach people how to find common ground in a world with so many conflicts, different opinions. We have to start to do that. And I think, you know, Georgetown nails that day in and day out and has for its whole history. So, you know, huge, huge um, influence on me, I think. Well, that's great. Well, uh, and I know that you're working with some of our current students on their entrepreneurial ideas. Um, if you think broadly for students who might be in school in the coming year, any advice you might have for them, you know, you were, uh, when, and let me ask this also, when you came to Georgetown as a freshman and studying foreign service, did you ever think you would be an entrepreneur? Uh, and maybe kind of that might lead to some of the advice you might give to students uh, who are coming to campus this year. Yeah. I don't know that I thought I would be an entrepreneur. I, I think I thought I was going to go to law school, actually. Um, but interestingly, all of my experiences at Georgetown, everything from, you know, the wonderful Problem of God class I took to the School of Foreign Service, which really was so much broader than that. You know, their business diplomacy course that I, course load that I took, um, really opened my eyes to, to international business and, and got me interested in that. So I think for, for students today, you are living in such an incredible time. It is there has never been maybe a better time to try new ideas. And that doesn't necessarily mean starting a company. It just means trying new ideas because I think that's what the world needs right now. Um, you can promote your idea in many different ways. It could be a product, it could be a service, it could be a webinar. Um, but I, I would say use the time that we're living in today to, to promote ideas. And it, you know, if, if you're not ready to start a company, I mean, it took me until I was in my 40s to start my company. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't feel the pressure. It will come when, when you want it to. Um, you know, just go, go get some operating experience. Go run a P&L. Those are, those are things that you will never um, not need in a business career. And I think that, um, you know, you talk to, if, if you ever talk to a lot of VCs, they don't all have operating experience. And I think that's something that is so needed in many of these companies. And you say this all the time, Jeff, it's about execution, right? It's a, anybody can have an idea. Ideas are uh, all over the place. Um, how do you execute that idea? So, 
So if you're not ready to start your company or a company, even though you know you might want to, go get operating experience. It's invaluable. I run a P&L. Yeah, go go find a problem you care enough about solving. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, and solving it may require creating your own business or it may mean joining a team of other people who are already working at it, right? Yeah, and you can learn some incredible things joining a, an existing startup too from, from leaders of those startups. And I mean, I certainly did early on, so. All right, so you've had a successful entrepreneurial experience. You've sold the business. You uh, just recently stepped down in your role as CEO and kind of left that one behind you. So what's next for Gretchen Hansen? You know, something entrepreneurial, that's that's what I do. Um, it's It's been in my blood for, I think, always, and I think it took a little time to come out, but um, I'm working on a few ideas right now, and hopefully in the next few months, we'll we'll show you what we're up to. All right. So you're not going to go to a big company again. Is that fair no, to say? I don't think so. I mean, I did that. It was it was good while I did it, and it's it's good to go back to what I know. Yeah. Well, and and I just want to maybe close out with this this topic of persistence, right? So you talked about how early on some of the challenges with building the the technology, you know, it was never exactly the way you wanted it, but you kept at it. Or the, you know, and, and how important is persistence and iteration oh, when it comes to being an entrepreneur? It's such a good question. There, there's almost nothing more important because, I mean, I'll tell you a story. I very early in 2014, I didn't think I had the beta product built. I was building the beta product, which was terrible, by the way. Um, I met with a very, very famous VC. Somebody had set up a meeting and I was fortunate to get the meeting and he and I sat down and explained it to him. I thought I did a good job, was pretty articulate about it, had understood all the consumer issues um, and how we were gonna execute it. And he looked at me and he said, that is a horrible idea. He said, that's a, one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. And, and so then we had a conversation about it, right? I'm pulling in my problem of God experience, like, okay, tell me why you think it's terrible. I, you know, l let me understand from you what you, you, how you think about this, because maybe it will help me with my next meeting. So the meeting ended and, uh, you know, I was, I was trying not to be bummed about it, but of course you're bummed when such a prominent VC is telling your idea is horrible. Um, but fast forward three years later, and I got a call from that same VC who desperately wanted to get on the call with his entire team and my team to give us money. So it's it's one of those things that believe in yourself. Don't listen to anybody else. If you love your idea and you believe in the customer and you believe in the product, like, you know, don't, if the experts tell you it's terrible, you know, just keep going because you never know what's going to happen or where you're going to end up. And, and uh, you know, it may be successful, it may not, but at least you will have tried and, and you want to make sure that you're always doing that. No, that's great. That's a great story and great advice. Uh, and and uh, if any of our audience members wanted to reach out to you, are you available for, uh, for yeah. contact or advice? Sure. Absolutely. And uh, they, can, they can contact me and I can forward them on. Uh, Maybe that's the easiest way to do it, or, or I didn't ask you in advance if you give out your own contact info. So uh, I don't think I can share it through the text for everybody, but but anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's Gretchen W. Hansen at gmail.com. You're welcome to email me. If you have All right. Time. Thanks for that. And, uh, and thanks so much for your time here and all you're doing to help out Georgetown entrepreneurs and our entrepreneurship Pleasure. program. Congrats on your success and the persistence that helped you get there. And uh, we hope we'll see everybody again for our next Inside Entrepreneurship webinar. Uh, thanks so much, Greg. Thanks, everybody. Bye.